so much, everybody. Um, you all pray, read, and speak so poignantly. I feel like I don't need to preach. <laughs> but Pastor Black spent so much time coaching me every sermon, <laughs> so I think because of his time, I will try this. <laughs> Let me check the microphone. Am I loud enough on Zoom space? Louder? Ah, okay. There's I, a lot of space to fill here. Okay, yes, I'm, you can see I'm new here. So I'll try to yell a little bit, so if I'm, we'll try. So good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Um, would you pray with me? Gracious God, who makes all things anew, we come to you today with the stories of our church and our neighborhood. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. 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 I've been spoiled. Thank you so much for joining us from Madrid. <laughs> I've been spoiled with my summers. Because I've been a student for so long, I got to work different jobs and travel during my summers. My summer gigs have ranged from a corporate job at a skyscraper in Hong Kong, I did not like that very much, to biking across America while volunteering with Habitat for Humanity. That biking trip was formative for me as the hospitality of Christians that fed and housed 30 sweaty young adults across the American heartland lured me back to church. That cross-country trip 11 years ago was also my first trip to Chicago. And I got a taste of the Windy City hospitality when I visited the Art Institute. We loved up our bikes in front of the iconic lion statue at the entrance and feasted our eyes on its treasures. My favorite artwork there remains Marc Chagall's sea-colored stained glass masterpiece called America Windows. In 1976, Chagall gave this monument to Chicago for the Bicentennial of America. By the time our church celebrates our Bicentennial in 2033, after we dedicated new windows today, perhaps our artists in residence, Alex and Max, will make us new windows. <laughs> when we came out of the Institute, however, our bikes were gone. <laughs> We asked the janitors by the lion statues where they saw what had happened to our bikes. And they responded, some guys cut our blocks and took our bikes. We were flabbergasted and realized that this city is not for the faint of heart. I thought I would never return here. <laughs> But God heals our traumas, and I visited the Institute three times this summer. Although I think they should give me free tickets. <laughs> For all the adventures on that biking trip, I will remember this summer as the most formative for me. Not only because of my daily runs and weekly dips at the lake, which reminds me of constant yet ever-changing love of God, but also because I now fully believe that I am called to be a pastor. I'm grateful for all the love I've received here as God paired me with a perfect mentor and congregation to discern my call. Thank you, young adults, magazine editors, and siblings of Bible study, prayer group, gospel choir, and design group for ministering to me as I learned to minister to you. First Church will remain my pe first pastoral love, and I will tell everyone at Princeton to come work here. <laughs> I learned that one of the joys of pastoring is sharing members' gifts with the community, as when Brandon guided young adults through the nooks and crannies of Chinatown for bubble tea and dim sum. For three weeks, Crystal led us thousands of years across thousands of miles to the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. 
We witnessed there the glory and grandeur of Assyria, Babylon, and Persia that conquered and ruled Israel and Judah. And she also called me out that I arranged this trip so I don't need to leave Bible study. <laughs> we took a picture there before a wing pool with a human head that used to guard the entrance to the Assyrian palace in modern day Iraq. It stretches and stands more than 16 feet wide and 16 feet tall. So the Oriental Institute had to wait till a ride from Iraq to put a wall and a roof over the museum. The Assyrians were the Americans of, the, of their day in their unmatched military might. Israelites trembled before this colossal bull as Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and it exiled Israelites. From Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, Isaiah prophesied to Judean king Hezekiah that unlike Israel, Judah will fend off Assyria. Isaiah 37 records that after Hezekiah prayed for divine protection, the angel of the Lord struck down more than 180,000 Assyrian troops. And Assyrian sources agree with the Bible. An Assyrian monument that Crystal pointed out that I would have overlooked because it's tiny, at the institute that teems with praise for their conquest is modest in its appraisal of war against Judah. It states simply, as for Hezekiah, I shot him up like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. Although only a few chapters separate Isaiah 37 from today's reading, more than a century separates Isaiah 39 from Isaiah 40. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah can be attributed to the prophet Isaiah himself, who lived around 700 BCE during the Assyrian siege. The next 27 chapters of Isaiah, however, are the works of anonymous disciples who wrote from Babylon where Jewish elites were exiled after Jerusalem fell around 600 BCE. I find it uncanny that this chapter division of Isaiah matches the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament. Today's reading is from later Isaiah, which begins at chapter 40, addressed to Jews no longer in their motherland. It was during this Babylonian, Babylonian captivity, which lasted some 70 years, that Isaiah declared renewal. So I'd like us to ponder, how could Isaiah preach hope and restoration when the Temple of Solomon was in ruins and the very survival of his people were uncertain. God's salvation for Jews in Babylon came from an unexpected source. The rise of the previous two world empires had been disastrous for the descendants of Jacob. But when the Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great rose to power, his rule turned out to be a blessing for the Jews who were allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the Temple. Isaiah 45 even called Cyrus God's anointed, and he is the only Gentile in the Bible to be given such honor. Jews had been wary of mingling with foreigners, yet God used the foreign king for his chosen people. Likewise, I believe God can use those beyond our faith to bless the faithful. For us Christians, later Isaiah contains some of our most cherished passages to root our Savior in the rich Jewish tradition of prophecy. Oopsie. Within it are the four songs of the suffering servant, which foreshadow the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, who chose the cross over the crown. In fact, Isaiah was so widely read among early Christians that it was called the fifth gospel. We do not have time for servant songs today, but remember that the clearest prophecies about our Redeemer were written amidst the trauma of exile. So what does all this history mean for us in Woodlawn? You will see in today's church magazine that on top of every page is the line from Isaiah 43 that our Lord is doing a new thing. I thought Pastor Black chose that line, but it turns out that Aurelia prophetically placed those words on our church bulletin. After working at first and living in Woodlawn, I can faithfully proclaim these words as my own testimony. 
When I first met Pastor Black last fall and worked virtually with FIRST, Sunday worship felt a little bare bones, if I may say. I loved the passion of Pastor Black, but there was no live music you add so much, Calvin. And I did not see many young adults. Then on my first day here this summer, I got a taste of the beehive that FIRST is through volunteering at the award-winning food pantry that Gail leads. As you will see in the resurrected First Church chimes, don't let the age of our church fool you, as we hustle and bustle like a church plant. Then on my second day, I met a team of U Chicago writers and actors. I had no idea then that Brendan Sayali and Ling would be such a blessing to our Sunday worship and young adult group. Last Sunday, I saw how creatively these actors enlivened our sanctuary. The scene with Brendan as pride and Sylvia as protagonist Betty melted my heart. Not only because of their spellbinding singing and acting, but also because I got to glimpse how carefully they thought and wrote during our dinners with Bob and Marilyn. During the recent prayer group meetings, we also got to hear how diligently they practiced as their overflowing music and songs animated our prayers. My first Sunday here, Juneteenth, was Sylvia's first Sunday, which makes me feel we are First Church twins. <laughs> I had no idea then that my last young adult gathering would be Sylvia's baptism at the lake. <laughs> last Tuesday, Sylvia in white robe and Pastor Black in black robe walked together towards sunset horizon, tinged in salmon and golden hues. Then Sylvia leaned on Pastor's arms and vanished on their ways before rising anew, now officially a sibling in Christ. Amen. 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 Just as Jesus taught us that one soul is more precious than the whole world, that moment felt more precious than the whole lake. This Tuesday, I'll return to Princeton Seminary, which educated several of us here today as well as the founder and the first pastor of First Church. As my program is in religion and society, perched between theology and history departments, one of my highlights this summer was perusing the First Church archive at Newberry Library with Pastor Black and Maeve. I hope you all continue the good work of querying our history, as those ancient pages oozed drama and wisdom. I learned that when First Church decided to move to Woodlawn from 41st and King Drive in 1926, our three aims were one, to minister to Presbyterian students living here, like Neil and Seo, two, to minister to young married couples living here, like Paula and Matt, and three, to provide housing for evangelists abroad on sabbatical, like the Cathy's who hosted Andrea. Through God's grace, we have been unwittingly living out the hopes of our ancestors. I also learned that when First Church discussed this merger with Woodlawn Park Presbyterian, we considered moving to Hyde Park. Ooh, right? <laughs> <laughs> our session meeting with records of 1926 notes that while Hyde Park is largely residential, in Woodlawn, I quote, there is a substantial business, theater, and amusement district, very much greater than anything in the Hyde Park section. Although Calvinists have a reputation for being cold and dry, we chose Woodlawn for fun. <laughs> <laughs> this sentence piqued my interest in our neighborhood history, so I asked some longtime residents of Woodlawn, of our church, what it was like to grow up here. And thank you so much for sharing today, Rochelle. Um, as Rochelle told me, we used to have several movie theaters and jazz clubs and nightclubs 
which could have been a little scandalous, I'm not sure. <laughs> in Woodlawn, an elevated train taking us to the beach. I also learned that this neighborhood used to house nine-story high Illinois Central Terminal. So Woodlawn welcomed countless black people during the Great Migration, as trains connected to Woodlawn ran from as far away as New York and Miami. Unfortunately, Woodlawn isn't what it was, although it is coming back to what it was. <laughs> when I first arrived at my first place on 62nd and Ellis, I had to live without a towel because there wasn't a store nearby that sold one. But I did dry myself, so don't worry. Yeah. I, although I love robust coffee and build coffee, I confess I often cross the midway for bites and sips. When I asked Woodlawn residents what happened to all the shops and restaurants here, the ugly truth seemed to be that racial integration of the 1950s has not been kind to Woodlawn in economic terms. I did not know what to make of the gains in civil rights undermining the vibrancy of this community. So I asked friend my Magna, who is a racial justice fellow at Loyola, where Marilyn teaches sociology. Magna explained that integration in Southside did not proceed as hoped, as it was integration without the radical revolution of values that Martin Luther King preached. She referred me to Dr. King's 1967 sermon at Riverside Church titled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. For King, a true revolution of values had to conquer the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. He warned that if America continued to spend more on our military defense than on social uplift, our fate can only be spiritual death. Exposing the irony of Vietnam War as a student of, of Niebuhr, King also preached that we watch black and white boys in brutal solidarity flooding the huts of a poor village, but we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. King referenced Isaiah twice in the sermon, including every valley shall be exalted of Isaiah 40 that we read today. Half a century later, we have an opportunity to enact Isaiah and King's prophetic calls to beat swords into plowshares. One of this summer's most exciting initiatives for me has been the design of a late night cafe for local youth at First Church. Our hope is that by providing a safe hangout space and job training, will shield our teenagers from violence that has plagued Southside. In both the Southside Interfaith Meeting and the Chicago Presbytery Meeting I attended this summer with Pastor Black, the most pressing agenda was gun violence. Pastor Black volunteered to host the next Presbytery Meeting against gun violence here, and I look forward to us becoming the beacon of peace in Southside. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. <laughs> Because you will have to do all the work. I'll be back at Princeton. So. <laughs> Friends, as I conclude my last sermon, I'd like to leave you with my belief that our church is at an inflection point between Isaiah 39 and Isaiah 40. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah focus on the judgment of Judah, while the next 27 chapters focus on the hope of restoration. First Church has moved southward several times since our founding in Fort Dearborn, and the most common reason has been white flight. Our decision to stay in Woodlawn in the 1950s was us finally confronting our sin of racism and repenting not just in words, but also in deeds. So a society church with a membership of 2,000 and the eldership of Marshall Field dwindled to a community church of the righteous remnant. We even partnered with a local gang, Blackstone Rangers, to empower the community. And we paid dearly for our courage, as you can see in the bullet holes in our windows. But God's wings covered us, and those bullets did not shed blood, 
while gang members surrendered more than 100 rifles to the church. We then formed the Woodlawn Organization with local ministers and activists to combat urban blight and brought public funds to our schools and youth. When I venture beyond the garth, I'm delighted by all the green pastures in full bloom with their sundry flowers and trees. Although we may not see today jackals and ostriches praising God as Isaiah did, I'm sure we had jackals and ostriches glorifying God when Woodlawn hosted the Chicago's World Fair in the 1890s. And I'm also delighted by the colorful murals that decorate the metro stations along Dorchester Avenue and tell the history of Woodlawn. We chose to stay and the seas our ancestors have sowed are bearing fruit. I see constructions of new buildings and renovations of old homes, and hear music and laughter flow out from homes and churches. I don't know how the advance of the university and the advent of a library will stretch the fabric of this community. But I do know that our church is commissioned to hold these mighty institutions accountable for all of God's children and preachers here. Thank you, First Church, for all the beautiful memories this summer. I promise I'll visit again, and I hope you can also visit me in New Jersey or my favorite, Korea. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.